custom as I begin each message to do it with a word of prayer. So I ask you to bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, as we open the Bible today, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth. Uh, most importantly, that we would be willing to put into practice all of the principles that we find in your word. Lord, bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for the wonderful reading of that scripture in Mark chapter 2. Uh, Mark is, I know this is going to sound funny, out of the four gospels, my favorite, which will tell you a little bit about me. Uh, John has all those very personal stories in the gospel of John, the wedding feast, Nicodemus in chapter 3, the woman at the well in chapter 4, the blind man restored in chapter 8, and the woman who's caught in adultery thrown at Jesus' feet, all those very personal stories. Luke and Matthew seem to emphasize things that are important for who they're trying to reach. Matthew trying to reach Jews, Luke, you know, more Gentile, but also Jews. But Mark is the guy that uses one word in the Bible more than any other writer. Does anyone know what word it is? Immediately. Every time he tells a story, he starts, then immediately Jesus went here. Then immediately Jesus went there, which tells you Mark may have either had ADHD or he was a guy on the go, and I love Mark's on the go. And here's the story, one of the greatest stories in all scripture. It starts with these words, and again he entered Capernaum. Who's he talking about here? Jesus, exactly. After some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Then what's verse 2 start with? immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. I'm going to stop there for a second because I believe today there are five reasons why our church exists. Now, some of you know me, you've heard my testimony or whatnot. My father was a Southern Baptist. My mother was a free Methodist. Now, if you know anything about the two types of uh, churches, uh, Southern Baptists have a strong belief in once saved, always saved. They come from the Calvinist line. Free Methodists come from the John Wesley line that it's no once saved, always saved. You make a commitment to Jesus every day to be saved. Now, how my mom and dad lived together for 60 years like that is just unbelievable. Shows you that Jesus crosses all lines. Amen. They were able to love each other and so forth. But when I decided to follow the uh, keep the Sabbath and follow the teachings I found in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, which are biblical teachings, that made me a Methabapta Adventist. Okay, <laughs> so I've got a little bit of all those traditions in my head, and sometimes it's interesting when I think, you know, I love my Baptist preacher who would hammer the pulpit, my Methodist preacher who went out and visited the sick and the poor, but I loved my Adventist preacher who really nailed me to staying in the Bible, not jumping out. So here we are jumping in the Bible today. We're going to talk about five reasons why the Seventh-day Adventist church is still, I believe, the best place on earth. No place like home. This is home. This is where Jesus resides. Now, I'm going to start with a story and I'm going to step away. I don't know if the camera's watching, but it's hard for me to stand still. Uh, a number of years ago, my wife and I got a, a card in the mail, like a, a, not a three by five, a little bigger than that, maybe a four by six card, inviting us to go to Sedona. Sedona's beautiful. Anyone been to Sedona? Okay, so there you go. To go to Sedona for a weekend. Actually, it was uh, three days, but not a weekend, starting on Sunday through Tuesday for $59 a night in a beautiful resort. I said, wow, you can't beat that. I can't even afford that, and I'm a preacher. So I decided, okay, let's go. So we took the kids, and we went to the Sedona, a beautiful resort. There was one little small print on there that I didn't read closely. You had to sit through a 90-minute presentation. Have any of you ever been through one of those? Okay. So as it turns out, we decided we did the presentation we were going to put at the very end of the trip. So we spent, you know, time at the spa and the pool and hiking around the beautiful red rocks. And then the last part of that uh, time together was at this place uh, where they had a bunch of people who were salesmen that dressed in Aloha shirts. They looked very comfortable in what they did. 
And sure enough, we sat down with this woman and a man, the two of them sat down and started sharing with us about this beautiful resort. Wouldn't you like to own this resort? I said, yeah, but that's unrealistic. I'm not going to own this resort when I drive a car that has 600,000 miles on it. I am not rich enough to own a resort. Oh, but you can own a week. I said, one week, how do you do that? And she starts explaining how you get this timeshare. And I said, hmm, I don't even think I could afford that. And then she said, well, hold on a second. You, you love this place, don't you? Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. She said, well, guess what? You don't even have to just stay here. You can go someplace else. She pulls out a book, and she's showing me all these places all over the world, you know, Hawaii and Fiji and, you know, all these places. You could go to any one of these. And then she asked a question she probably regretted because I think she had me on the hook. And, you know, she said, where do you think is the greatest place on earth? And I said, home. You read my mind. And my favorite home is the church. She looked at her friend and she said, I have no answer for that. Give him the gift and let him go. <laughs> she was hoping I would say Hawaii or Fiji. She had an answer for me. But what is she going to say when I say church is the best place on earth? There were no timeshares inside of a church, I have to tell you. And so she gave up on me. And I thought about it afterwards. Really, this should be the best place on earth. Amen? This should be a place where people come, feel comfortable, feel loved, feel respected. Find Jesus more than anything else. So we start with that verse 1. It says that it was reported that Jesus was in the house. Now, it was noised. How many of you are still using the King James? Okay. I still use the King James. I compare, cross-reference it. By the way, still one of the most literal Bibles. So for those of you who do Bible studies, don't give up on the King James. Even though the language could be a little tough, the these and thous, it's very literal. It uses the word, it was noised that Jesus was in the house. Now, if you were to go to the original Greek, that word noised means it was like a town crier. Anyone know what a town crier is? Like the greatest town crier, most famous one in history. Do you know who that was? Paul Revere. Running through town saying, the British are coming. The British are coming. Okay. That's what this verse or word means. So someone was running through town saying, hey, this great new fancy preacher's here. Come see him. Come listen to him. He's wonderful. He's great. You got to hear him. So this message went out to this town, and because Jesus was there, guess what? Immediately the house filled up. People wanted to hear what this Jesus had to say. The first reason why our church is the best place to be, the Sierra Vista Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first reason why any church is the best place to be is because Jesus is there. Amen? Jesus should be found in everything we do. Everything we do. I had the opportunity uh, when Hurricane Andrew came through Florida many years ago. I remember it was a very small hurricane. One of the smallest ones in history. Tiny little window. It wasn't like uh, Katrina that took up hundreds and hundreds of miles. This was a tiny hurricane, but it packed a wallop. 187 mile an hour sustained winds. It was lifting planes right off the ground. It was throwing houses everywhere. It was a mess. This was a terrible hurricane. Well, I had the opportunity of going there with a group of students from Columbia Union College, one of our Sunday Adventist colleges, to help rebuild some of the homes. We were down there fixing things and so forth. Even the churches, everything. Businesses flattened in one particular area near Homestead, uh, um, Florida. So we're out there working, and I came across this pile of rubble. And it was interesting. I was there with a contractor. He knew what he was doing, fixing stuff. I was, give me a hammer and nails and tell me what to hit, you know. But sure enough, he was there saying, you know, pointing at, well, this one we can't do anything about. And they had these spray painted numbers on the rubble. You know, it would say like AL28734, you know, SF, da, 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 da. you know what they were? Insurance numbers, people who had hurricane insurance. M many of them didn't have any insurance, but we came across this one makeshift sign that I'll never forget. Someone took a piece of paneling and a couple of two by fours that were broken off at their house that didn't have an insurance number on it and nailed this paneling to these two by fours, stuck it in the ground and wrote these words. 
no Jesus, no peace. And then underneath that, they wrote these words, K-N-O-W, no Jesus, no peace. Amen? They realized they, they may have lost everything they had in that house. Every dollar, dime, whatever they had might have been invested in that house. But they had a relationship with Jesus Christ, so they knew how to have peace. Amen? The greatest way on earth to have peace is to have a relationship with Jesus. Jesus when he is in the house, whether it be our own house, our home, or this house we call the church, it will be the greatest place on earth. And people will want to be there. People will want to see this Jesus that we have. Secondly, let's go to verse 2. Verse 2 says, Immediately many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And what did Jesus do? He preached the word to them. Think about that. If Jesus is our great example and he's preaching the word, shouldn't we be doing the same? Now, I have to tell you, unfortunately, you know, our, uh, many of our preachers today are preaching philosophies, ideas that they have in their mind. They're preaching politics or, you know, some kind of a social issue. And not that those things are unimportant, but nothing is more important than God's word. Amen. They should be preaching God's word. Now, today was great. I heard a beautiful Sabbath school class, and I really appreciated the emphasis on God's word. And let's go to this verse. Let's go to that verse. Let's go to this verse. Would someone read this? Would someone read that? We should be the church of the book. Do you remember that? When I joined the Seventh-day Adventist church in 1981, it's a long time ago now, but when I joined, the church was known as, uh, the people of the church were known as the people of the book. Why was that? Adventists could be seen walking down the streets with their Bibles in their hands. Now, I'm carrying an iPad, so I'm a bad example, okay? But it looks like a beat-up old Bible, doesn't it? Do you see that? Okay? So I kind of, my wife says, please get rid of that. It's embarrassing. I said, no, I'm going to keep it until it falls apart. Well, it's almost there. You know? But we should be known as people of the book, people who love Jesus, but not just love Jesus, but love his word. He gave us that word. I had the opportunity some years ago, and I've told this story a bunch of times, so you might have heard this one before. But I had the opportunity of, while I was in college at Columbia Union College, which is now Washington Adventist University in Tacoma Park, Maryland, I had the opportunity of visiting different churches. The president, or I should say the person in charge of the theology department was a man named Ken Stout, Dr. Stout. Dr. Stout said, hey, I want you guys to go out and visit some of the churches in the community. It was a wonderful time to be an Adventist in that community. We had um, Ron Halverson was the pastor of the Tacoma Park Church, a powerful preacher. Man, he'd bring you to your knees listening to his message. You want to give your life. Even if you just got baptized, you'll make a commitment to get rebaptized. He's so, such a powerful preacher. We also had a guy named C.D. Brooks preaching there. Another powerful preacher. He was in Baltimore. We took a ride up to listen to him. Whitley Phipps had just come to town. He not only was a great preacher, but a great singer. So we had a wonderful experience there. Then Dr. Stout said, I want you to go out and visit some of the other churches. Not just the Seventh-day Adventist church, but visit some of the other. Okay, well, being raised a Baptist, I went to a Baptist church, heard, you know, a good preacher there. And we, a group of us, four of us theology students, went together to an AME church. Does anyone know what AME is? African Methodist Episcopal Church. And we thought, oh, Episcopal, it'll be very straight line and so forth. No, no, not the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So we walk into this gigantic church. I mean, gigantic, probably set, set three, 4,000 people. We go in and sit all the way down in the front row to hear this preacher. We're supposed to take notes on the preacher. This preacher was pounding the pulpit, sweat flying everywhere. Deacons were running up and handing him a towel every once in a while so he could wipe his forehead, give him another, and they bring him another towel. He was preaching his heart out. He was going to town, and it was a good message. I was taking notes and writing down verses, flipping the pages. Every time he, he quoted a Bible verse, afterwards, at the end, they ushered you out. And let me tell you, those ushers were dressed to kill. They had black suits, black tie, white shirt. They looked like that movie, Men in Black. They even had the sunglasses and everything. You know, they were ushering us out to the back. We get to the back 
And we are the first ones to shake the hand of the pastor because we sat in the front row. They ushered from front to back. My friend Frank, who went into ministry as well, Frank King grabs the guy's hand and he looks at him and he says, I know where you boys are from. I looked at the two other guys with me and said, how could you know that? I said, I'll give you five. I'm the sanguine in the group. I'm the guy that likes to talk. So I said, I'll give you five guesses. You'll never get it. I only need one. You boys are Seventh-day Adventists, aren't you? He said, what? How in the world did he pick that out with you? I said, okay, now you got to tell me how you know that because there is no way. Does, does it say on my shirt? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Do I have my college logo on there? I, you know, he said, first of all, you boys came. He said, I have 3,000 members. None of them ever sit in the front row. I said, none of them ever sit in the front row of my church. How'd that get me away? He said, secondly, he said, every time I quoted a verse, you guys were flipping through the Bible to see if what I said was right. He said, I hate to admit it, but I could say um, the Bible says such and such, and it's in the book of Hickory Dickory Dock, and my people would just believe it. They just believe what I say. You were checking out everything I said. He said, and the other thing is you had your Bibles. My members don't bring their Bibles to church. We had pew Bibles and that's all they use. You guys were underlining. And he said, he said, that kind of gave you away. I said, okay. And he said, and one more thing. He said, every year at this time, some of you preachers come from Columbia Union College to hear me speak. <laughs> ah. So I was a little disappointed, burst my bubble. But the truth is, wouldn't it be known, wouldn't it be nice if we were still known as people of the book? We need to be in the Bible every day. Now, I have a couple of neighbors in my community. One of them is from Iraq, okay, interestingly enough. He actually grew up in Baghdad. Think about that. He's a next-door neighbor, but he's, he's not Islamic. He's a um, Coptic Christian, if you know what that is. He, came to, he comes to me every once in a while like the old... Uh, what was the name of the movie where Wilson looks over the window? Yeah, I remember that. Tool time. Yeah, the tool. Home improvement. He looks up. Hey, Ed, I got a question for you from the Bible. So we're sharing over our wall Bible studies. He knows that I study my Bible. You know, when people know you study your Bible, they'll want to know, hey, what about this? What about that? Or why do you believe this way or that way? It's important for us to be serious about God's word. I want to share with you a passage. Go to Acts chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. This is an important verse because some of us think our only ministry is to collect offering or, you know, whatever. But think about this. It says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you, this is the early church, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Whom we may appoint over this business, taking care of the poor and so forth, which is a very important business. Whom we may appoint over this business. And then it says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and what? The ministry of the word. So it's not just studying the word. It's a ministry. We minister to others through God's word. You know, I've had the opportunity of preaching in the Middle East, um, the Philippines, Thailand, Cuba, Canada, just to name a few, Mexico, you know, and my experience has been every place I've been, there are people hungering for God's word. Uh, never more than when I went to Russia, and I'll share that with you in a moment. But when I went to Russia, there were people, I remember we held a series of meetings that were five, six weeks long, five nights a week for six weeks. Two weeks into the meeting, we said, if you've been here every night, you could keep the Bible. We were letting them read through the Bible in Russian and um, kind of one of those, uh, it is written TV show version Bibles. And so they had the Bible. After two weeks, I, will, I was watching people take those Bibles and just clutching them, holding them like they were holding a newborn baby because they had never had a Bible before in their life. You know how many Bibles I have? I'm, I, I'm almost embarrassed to admit this. I probably have 20 Bibles in my house. They had the only Bible they had ever had clutching it. And then the next night, 
All those people were coming to the meeting asking me to sign it. I was getting writer's cramp. You know, 500 people, oh, could you sign it? Can you write a Bible verse? Can you write a prayer for me? Can you? Okay, um, I don't speak Russian. I can say, Yanopani Mayu, you know, I don't understand. Or, you know, Dobro Pajalovic, welcome, you know, whatever. But I'm writing things on there. By the time I got to person number 250 or 300, I was just writing Ed Keys. And then it was EK, you know, because my hand was starting to hurt. But here's the amazing thing. They loved that Bible so much. They got to read God's word for themselves. This was shortly after the Iron Wall came down, the, or I should say the Berlin Wall came down. So the second reason why we still exist and why this is still the best place on earth and why there's no place like home is because God's word is here. Jesus, God's word. That's pretty simple, right? Well, let's go back to verse 5. In Mark chapter 2, it says this. So when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, how many of you are following along with me? I don't want you to miss this. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, you are healed. Is that what he said? Interestingly enough, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, you would think a paralyzed man, more than anything, the most important thing would be to have the divine healer touch him, lift him off the ground, raise him back to newness of life, in a sense, and be able to walk. Before I went into ministry, I had two other careers. I was a mechanic, and I was a paramedic. If I would have been called as a paramedic to an accident scene, someone laying on the ground, and I just said, hey, your sins are forgiven you, buddy, and then got back in the ambulance and drove away, they would have said, hey, what's my tax money going for here, you know? Can someone come back and help me? The truth is this forgiveness is exactly what this man needed. Unbelievable, but one of my favorite, and well, I'll say this, one of my favorite books of all time is a book called Desire of Ages, and that part's not unbelievable. How many of you have got that book? If you don't have it, I, we'll set you up with one. I love the book, Desire of Ages. Nowadays, we, we're giving out a lot of great controversies because it's got history and, it, and points to end time events. But I still love Desire of Ages better. And here's why. It continually points back to the Jesus of this book, the Bible. And nothing's greater than Jesus. Now, notice what it says. Desire of Ages, this is page 267, if you want to read it later on at your own um, leisure. Here's what it says. Like the leper, this paralytic had lost all hope for recovery. His disease was the result of a life of sin. Most commentaries agree. You know, the construction of this passage says that this man was a, a true sinner and his sufferings were embittered by remorse. He had long before appealed to the Pharisees and doctors, hoping for relief from mental suffering and physical pain. But they coldly pronounced him incurable and abandoned him to the wrath of God. The Pharisees, listen to this line, regarded affliction as an evidence of divine displeasure. So if you're sick, God is mad at you. That's the way the Pharisees looked at it. And they held themselves aloof from the sick and the needy. Yet often these very ones who exalted themselves as holy were more guilty than the sufferers they condemned. The palsied man was entirely hopeless, or helpless, excuse me. And seeing no prospect of aid from any quarter, he sunk into deep despair. Then he heard of the wonderful works of Jesus. He was told that others as sinful and as helpless as he had been healed. Even lepers had been cleansed. And the friends who reported these things encouraged him to believe that he too might be cured if he could be carried to Jesus. But his hope fell when he remembered how the disease had been brought upon him. He feared that the pure physician would not tolerate him in his presence. And then finally, the last line on that statement says this. Yet it was not physical restoration he desired so much as relief from the burden of sin. If he could see Jesus and receive the assurance of forgiveness and peace with heaven, 
he would be content to live or die according to God's will. The cry of this dying man was, oh, that I might come into his presence. Isn't that beautiful? Now, you, now I know you're going to want to read that book when you go home. How beautiful that statement. Here this man is. He was content. He didn't care if he got healed or not. All he knew was Jesus had the power to forgive him. And when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven you, he was good to go. They could have, they could have carried him back up to the roof again, you know, where they lowered him through. And he would have been fine. Still in that paralyzed state on that bed because he knew the most important thing he needed in his life was forgiveness of sin. Now I want you to think about this. As some years ago when I was in uh, college, I was living in the Washington DC area and I decided to take a trip down around Memorial day to the veterans Memorial wall. You know, that big wall with the 60 some thousand names of those who died in the war. So I went down there and I noticed a news reporter interviewing a guy. And I said, well, this is quite interesting. I want to see what, I, and first of all, I thought it was kind of crude. Here the guy is in tears. He's at the wall. You know how you take the pa they take the paper and etch the name off the wall and keep it. Well, he was working on that. And this news reporter, Channel 10 News, I still remember, was trying to get this guy's attention, finally gets his attention and says, sir, sir, did you serve in the war? Yes, I did. And he said, well, we see you looking at that name. What are you doing? Well, he said, this man died for me. Now, think about that. Now, we look at it in the, the terms of war, someone willing to give his life to save someone else. Well, sometimes we forget that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He threw his body on a grenade called sin. He took the shot that we deserve so that we could be forgiven and live with him forever. Amen. I was preaching in Cuba. I mentioned one of the places I preached. I was uh, first night of the meeting. I remember showing up in an auditorium about the size of this church and the place was packed Packed to the gills. People were looking at, they actually literally opened the windows and people were looking in from the windows, people looking in from the two doors to the building. It was amazing standing there and I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm preaching to really a, a excited crowd. They want to be here. But the typical thing a pastor will ask or an evangelist will ask the pastor is, how many of these people are visitors and how many are your church members? Because the church members should already know Jesus, right? They should already know. I want to know if there's some there that don't know him so I can know exactly how to reach them. So he said, pastor, the guy, the pastor's name was Pablo Soler. He says to me, pastor, he said, none of them are members. We told the members to stay home. I said, why would you do that? He said, we knew this place would be full because the people here in Cuba have been denied the opportunity. This was right after communism. It would been denied the opportunity of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said, oh, great, wonderful. This whole church filled with people wanting to hear about Jesus. I remember preaching uh, that first night. And then after the meeting, a couple of the elders got together and came and talked to me. Now, Cuban Spanish is fast, I can tell you. My friend Ray, when he talks Spanish, I can understand it. You know, someone from Peru, I can understand it. My wife is Cuban. When she talks Spanish, I'm sitting there going, yo no sé, you know. <laughs> I, I, could, I could go back to Russian. Ya no pani mayo. She's going, a hundred, it's rapid. So they're talking to me really fast. They get a translator to explain, what are they talking about? They sound exasperated. He said, yeah, they say there's a, there's a judge here, a Cuban judge in the audience. I said, fabulous. We like our leaders. You know, I'm glad he's here. No, no, Pastor, you don't understand. Cuban judges are put in place for one reason, to make sure the Communist Party line is held to firmly. And if anyone who is not a Christian accepts Christianity, they will be put in prison. I said, oh, that is serious. So we got together with a group and prayed about it. And they said, so, Pastor, are you going to continue your meetings? I said, I'm here for three weeks. I'm going to preach every night. I'm an American. All they could do to me is kick me out of the country. They said, you don't know that. <laughs> this is Cuba. I said, all right, I'll take my own risk. I believe God's in control of this thing. I preached every night, and the Cuban judge was sitting in the back, with a, sitting with a beautiful woman, sitting in the back of the audience. 
Well, the night I made the appeal to give your life to Jesus, this Cuban man's wife comes down to the front. Now, I was excited. I said, wow, the judge's wife is giving her life to Jesus. Now, that's not exactly the same feeling the leaders of the church had. She's probably KGB. She's probably a spy just trying to figure out who else is going to join and get baptized so that she can tell her husband and they can be put in jail. He said, so what do we do? I said, I take it at face value. You know, I believe she gave her life to Jesus. And sure enough, we get to the end of the series and there were 104 people that signed up to be baptized. Amen. Praise the Lord. I was so excited about that. I said, yes. She was one of them, signed up to be Baptist. I remember when we got together to organize the baptistry. By the way, the baptistry, Pastor Snell did not look clean or nice like this. It was pretty, dis, pretty much in disrepair. And the water was a kind of a mild uh, greenish color, you know, a little bit like uh, peat moss or something, you know. So I said, okay, who, am I doing the baptism or are you doing, Pastor? He said, we're going to do them together. There's a lot of people. I go, okay, we'll do it together. So I get in the baptistry with him and I see stuff floating on my robe and I'm like, okay. And there may be some creatures swimming around in the water. And he goes, here's what we decided. We decided to baptize the Cuban judge's wife last. I said, well, that makes sense, but why? He, he said, well, in case someone comes in here and starts arresting people, at least the other people gets baptized first. They get, and, uh, and if the KGB come in and start shooting, at least we'll all be saved. I said, okay, before we get to her. Okay, I got it. So sure enough, we get to the baptism. I baptized her. At, by the way, our baptism was one for the record books, the longest baptism in the history of baptisms. I mean, every single person had their favorite Bible verse read. Some of those were whole chapters and their favorite hymn sang. So 104 Bible chapters or verses and 104 hymns before we got to this lady. I was sitting there going, and standing in that water, my legs looked like prunes and raisins, you know, from standing in the water this long, a baptism that lasted six and a half hours. And sure enough, she comes into the baptistry, and Pablo Soler, the pastor, gets out and walks out. I said, I'm here alone with this lady. I guess I'm going to have to try to protect her if someone starts shooting. I did the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, put her in the water, brought her up out of the water, and you could hear a pin drop. You could swear everybody knew something bad was going to happen. But there was one loud amen, and the way he said it was amen. Sounded like it had a G at the end. It was the Cuban judge. And I thought, wow. So sure enough, she comes out of the water. We introduce everyone, had to take a big picture and so forth. And I ran right to this judge. And I said, I said, listen, I got to talk to you. I said, my Spanish isn't that great, but I'll do whatever I can. I get, I'll get an interpreter. He goes, I speak, I speak fluent English. And I looked at him, wow. So I said, okay. We sat together and I said, you got to tell me something. Um, you're supportive of your wife becoming a part of the church, giving her life to Jesus, being baptized. What about you? Where are you on this, on the scale? He goes, I am a Saul of Tarsus. I said, wow. I said, you know your Bible? He said, you'll be surprised how well I know my Bible. He said, I've been studying it for years, but my responsibility to the government was put people in jail who studied their Bible. He said, I've done that. And he said, one member of this church I put in jail for 22 years for passing out one piece of literature. So, whoa. He goes, I regret that now, but God can never forgive someone like me. So I'm happy for my wife, but I can never be forgiven. I said, wait a second. You just quoted Saul of Tarsus. You know, you're coming from the book of Acts. Do you remember what Saul of Tarsus became? He goes, yes, he became Paul, right? I said, that's right. Paul was a persecutor of Christians just like you, and he gave his life to Jesus. You can do it too, my brother. We prayed together. He didn't know what he was going to do. He figured there were guys outside watching his every movement. Turns out he was so embedded in the communist power, they weren't watching him. They just trusted him, you know, to be coming to this meeting. Later on, about a year or so later, Mark Finley, does that name sound familiar? He was in Cuba and he baptized this judge. Amen. Now, the part, the part that amazes me is this. 
when Mark's group talked to him about becoming a part of the church, he said, what was it? Was it the Sabbath, state of the dead, second coming? What was it that really touched your life? He said, when the preacher from New Jersey, <laughs> that's where I was from at the time, when the preacher from New Jersey gave an appeal to give your life to Jesus, that Jesus would forgive all your sins. He said, I've been wondering about that all my life. Could God forgive someone like me? The greatest message we have is not this message. It's great. Don't get me wrong. I love the teachings of this church. But the greatest message is the greatest of message is the message of forgiveness. Amen. When we tell people that Jesus forgives them, that he wants to save them, it is unbelievable how and what kind of effect that has on our life. Okay. So here you have it. Three reasons so far. Jesus is here. This place is filled with God's word, and this is a place where people can find forgiveness easily. Amen? The fourth one, healing takes place here. And this is one that's a little scary for some people, but let's go back to that passage in Mark chapter 2. And let's start with verse 3. And because it tells the story of these four friends, incredible friends they must have been. Then they carried him, bringing a paralytic who was car or carried by four men. Verse 4, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. But he didn't stop there. Verse 6, some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemy, blasphemy like this? Who can forgive sin but God alone? Were the scribes and Pharisees correct? Yes, they were. Only God can forgive sins. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that the, they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately, there's another immediately, he rose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed, glorifying God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Healing took place in that little house. Healing should take place in this house. It should take place in our own homes. When we love Jesus, and I don't just mean physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, all of that healing, but even physical healing. Sometimes we shy away from that. But James chapter 5 gives us the method, the prescription for healing. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, anointing them with oil, praying over them in the name of the Lord. I had a bunch of amazing experiences, but one I want to share with you. We had a young man when I was in college. His name was Dean. Um, Dean had a serious Ill illness with his back. His spine was out of place. You know, they said, we're going to have to do a spinal fusion. We're going to have to literally tear your back apart to recreate it in order for you to walk. He was in a wheelchair. So they said, so, so Dean uh, was setting up for this surgery. And, you know, a lot of times we pray when a person's going into surgery and we think, okay, we pray the surgery is successful. Don't forget to pray that they don't need the surgery. Amen. So, you know, we're a bunch of college students. We're, you know, we're somewhat naive, you know, but we're also filled with faith, knowing that God could do anything. So we get around this guy. We anoint him with one of the professors of our college. We pray for him. He goes to the um, hospital next door, right next to the college campus. At the time, uh, it was called the Washington Adventist Hospital, but he goes to the hospital. I don't know what they call it now. But anyway, went over there. Got some x-rays. They said, got him ready for surgery. They said, okay, well, well, you need to be here on such and such a day for this surgery. Amazingly, he was able to get out of his wheelchair. Now, he could stand up on, by himself anyway, but he got up out of his wheelchair, and he felt like his legs were capable of moving. So he started walking a little and walked a little more, and the surgery was like three or four days later. He went back to the hospital, and he said, I, I don't know if I need surgery. He said, of course you do. And he walked in, not in a wheelchair. And he said, yeah, come to think of it, this is strange. We've never seen you walking. Let's do some more tests. They put him back under some MRIs and x-rays and whatever else they do for those situations. They said, this is remarkable. The curvature in the, your back is moving. It's straightening out. 
This was almost 40 years ago. Dean is still walking and never had the surgery. God still does those kind of miracles. Now, I don't know why he doesn't do it more often. We got to trust God with that. But one thing I know for sure, don't be afraid to pray for someone who needs healing. I believe God's still in the business of healing. Now, finally, the last one. This church is not just here because we present the message of Jesus and we present forgiveness and God's word is preached and healing is found here. But notice this verse. Verse 5 is the, the critical point in Mark chapter 2. Look at it one more time. When Jesus saw... Whose faith? Their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. When he saw whose faith? Their faith. The four men that dropped him. It wasn't his faith. Not even the paralyzed man's faith. Jesus was looking at the faith of those who brought him to his feet. Think about that. That's a powerful message for each one of us. To bring people to Jesus. When Jesus sees your faith, that person's life is changed and touched in a dramatic way. Amen? We need to never be afraid to bring someone to Christ. There have been times, I have to admit, I've been pretty puny at sharing my faith. And I think, why? Look what God did for me. Never be afraid to do that. Bring people to the feet of Jesus. You've been through a, a rough time. You've lost a loved one. You know someone else who's lost, lost a loved one. You could share with them what God has done to help you through that rough time. You've gone through a, a difficult time at work. You know others who are going through that. Share that with them. You've, lost a, uh, um, you've been through a divorce, a, one of the most difficult things on earth. You could share with others who have gone through something like that. Debt, disease, disaster. You have the opportunity of taking someone through that rough time, like the four men, and lowering them at the feet of Jesus. It is my prayer that we will use that same faith that these four men had in order to bring people to the feet of Jesus. I'm going to close with a story. And by the way, Luke chapter 18, 8, you know what that says, right? Anyone know what Jesus is looking for when he comes again? Faith. Luke 18, 8 says, will the son of man find faith when he returns? Not just a faith, your own faith in him, but a faith that's willing to go out of your way to help others find Jesus. Some of you know the story of Commander Scott O'Grady. He was a pilot flying for the United Nations, well, flying for the United States Navy at the time, but flying for the United Nations, flying missions over Bosnia-Herzegovina when, when it was the really heavy part of their civil war going on. As he was flying over, some of you remember, he was taken out by a surface-to-air missile, hit his plane, parachuted out, got down, got behind enemy lines, They've even made a movie out of it, although the movie's not anywhere close to what really happened. But, but sure enough, he's behind enemy lines fighting for his life, trying to avoid the enemy catching him. He knew he would be killed instantly if they caught him. So he's doing everything he can, hiding in weeds, moving in the shadows, moving at night, uh, trying to rest during the day, eating grubs off of the trees and so forth to survive. You've, you've heard this story, I'm sure. Well, if you haven't, look it up. Well, as it turns out, Commander Scott O'Grady was rescued. Now, what's amazing about this rescue is the, the, uh, excuse me, the aircraft carrier that sent those to rescue him sent 64 men to rescue him. Marines, special forces people, Navy SEALs, 64 people were sent to rescue one guy. Yeah, we think of it as what a ridiculous waste of resource. What if those 64 guys died just for one? Ha, think about that. Jesus died just for one. Amen. And that one could be you or me. God was willing to empty heaven of its greatest resource, Jesus Christ, to save us. It took faith for those men to go out, risk getting killed to save their friend. We're not even risking getting killed to share, a share with a neighbor the wonderful truths of Jesus or a coworker, or someone would meet at Taco Bell or, you know, whatever. Don't be afraid 
to bring this wonderful news of Jesus to your friends, family, co-workers, because I believe God will use that in a mighty way. And then Pastor Snell will get, he'll end up with the raisin looking feet from baptizing so many people. And I think he's okay with that because we want to see more people accepting the wonderful message of Jesus. I want to pray with you as we close and ask you before I do that, how many of you just like to say, I want to be available for Jesus. I want to be used by him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for your love, for your blessings, for each one of these brothers and sisters here in this room that said, yes, I want to be used by you. I want to be available. Take my little faith and make it strong for you to bring people to the feet of your son, Jesus, for we pray in his name. Amen.